Now we're ready. All right. Welcome out there in video land. Glad you could join us tonight. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 39. And we will begin in verse 1. And it reads as this. At that time, I, I hear a question. I heard something, so I looked up. Okay. Excuse me. At that time, Merodach, Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, said, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them his treasure, excuse me, he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oils, his whole armor, armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in, in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. All right. Let's break this down. Let's have some fun with it. Uh, anybody care to tackle uh, verse 1 and 2 and 3 and any of those verses? Let's don't do it that way. First of all, let's talk about kingdoms here. The kingdom of Babylon... This particular king, had, he was notorious for trying to find uh, allies that would help him overtake other countries. He didn't have a lot of power in and of himself, even though it was a large country. But he would, he would do his best to try to find other lands that would come alongside him. And in this case, he knew exactly how to work Hezekiah. And, and Hezekiah was... Although he knew how to pray and he knew how to call on God, he wasn't a very smart king. He wasn't. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible records, uh, in, in, I say that, the, the notes in the Bible record that he was a pretty poor king. Because he constantly looked outside himself and outside the God of his country, the God of his nation of Israel, for someone to help him. He was always looking or someone else to come to his aid, to be his ally. And so, uh, and 39 paints a vivid, broad stroke picture of that. Now, at this time, uh, the king of Babylon had sent envoys of letters, wishing him well, <coughs> applauding the fact that he had overcome this, this illness that was going to take his life, and that he had recovered, and, and he sent him presents, and he even come to visit him. And when he came to visit him, what did Hezekiah do? Well, let me show you everything. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you, when somebody sends you something free in the mail, and then they show up at your front door to tell you more about the sighting that you're gonna get for free if you just allow them to show it to all your neighbors, how many of you show them you're safe, your gun safe, and everything else in your house? I mean, let, let's face it. You may have some new neighbors that move in, and they come over and bring you a pie. Because we're new neighbors, and we just want to say hello. We just want to get to know people in our neighborhood. You don't say, hey, come on in. Hey, let me show you. Come over here. Look at my gun collection. And over here, I got a rare coin collection right here. Don't even lock it up. We just keep it here in these drawers. How many of you do that? 
No, it doesn't it just doesn't. I mean, hey, can you hook in my car? I don't lock it at night. Leave the keys in it. Right in the center console. But there it is. Hey, what do you think? None of us do that. Right. But but Kenny Hezekiah, he was so excited to show everything he had. And these guys are going, all right, all right, we can use that. We can use that. That will do us good. I mean, anybody see this coming? I mean, when you're reading it, did you did you see this coming? Don't you think that Hezekiah was trying to form an alliance, trying to get protection from Babylon to join him against the Assyrians? Absolutely. Absolutely. He thought he thought that they were coming to help him, and they thought he was going to help them. That's right. I mean, this is like this is like two chickens in the sandlot. And they're both trying to get protection from each other. And neither one of them have any gumption. Here, let me show you what I got. He didn't ask God what to do. He didn't ask God who he should show it to him. Oh, no. Oh, no. That, that's where he fell right there. He Hezekiah made lots of mistakes. And, and, and that was his biggest mistake was... In the prior two chapters, we noticed Hezekiah always spoke to God. This time he didn't. He just, once again, once his life, he felt like his 15 years had been added, his life was safe, he went back to living like he normally would. Now, let's fast forward. Let's bring that home to us. When we go through a tragedy, kind of like Hezekiah did, where he was told you're dying, and you're not going to get better. And then the Lord said, well, you know what? I heard you in travail. I heard you crying out to me. I heard you. I've seen your tears. And so I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Oh, okay, then. All's good now. Now I'll go back to acting like I always did. I'll go back to doing what I've done in the past, and that was seek help from somebody other than God himself. The only time he was seeking God was when God told him, you're dying. Then he took the time to seek God and to seek his wisdom. Prior to that, what did he do? Well, he had, he had seeked God before. He had. No, but, but, but only when he was in trouble. That's right. Was in trouble. That's right. But before he went out and did something foolish, he always turned to God first. He would always, well, hold when, on. When his country was in trouble. He would always go first and try to form an alliance. So let, let, me, let me set that record straight. He would always try to form an alliance with somebody first. If that alliance failed, then he would go to God. Because remember, he tried to trust in Egypt to come to his aid early on. And then he tried to trust in, uh, uh, what was it, I think the Assyrians. Because they were going to attack him. And then at one point, uh, there was another nation coming against him. And he thought maybe the Assyrians would help him since they were going to attack him anyway. He was always looking for somebody to protect him. And the greatest protector he ever needed, he already had. He just didn't know how to use it. It's kind of like us. The greatest protection we'll ever need is God, and we don't know how to use him. We don't know how to utilize him in our lives. We don't know how to allow him to be our hedge of protection. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb here just a little bit. Hey, if you have struggles in your finances, God will be the hedge around you if you will allow him. If you struggle in your marriage, God will be the hedge around you if you will allow him. If you struggle with your children, God will be a hedge around you if you will allow him. The problem is, is we call on everything else first. And when that doesn't work and we're left no choices, then we'll get on our knees and go before the Lord. Yes. Seems to always work like that. I don't know why. Maybe it's just us as humans. We think we've got to work it out first. And it's never been like that. You know, I, one of the, there's, there's a couple things that I'm famous for. Most people look at it and say, he is famous for procrastination. No, I really wait upon the Lord. And sometimes that gets mistaken for procrastination. Now, there's one thing I have learned in, in the business world of life. If you procrastinate long enough, a lot of problems will fix themselves. Right. 
And people go, no, that never happened. Yes, it does. Because most of the time people come to you with a major issue, it's not an issue. It's only an issue to them. If you will let them have a few minutes, they'll work their issue out. And so sometimes procrastination is a good thing. But for me, procrastination is about waiting on the Lord. For, for you, it should be about waiting on the Lord. We should wait upon him for everything that happens in our lives. Honestly. Now, I know that's hard for some of us to understand and believe, but that's that's the way God made, made us to be. It's hard to do, not believe or understand. Well, that's probably true. That's probably a, a true way of saying it. It's, it's not hard to believe or understand. It's just hard to do it. It's hard to apply it. Now, one of the things here about showing everything he had, uh, <clears throat> and I like the way the Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, hey, king, have you ever thought about who these men are and where they come from? <clears throat> have you ever thought about that? Well, they come from a foreign land. They come a long ways. They come from Babylon. Okay. And have you thought about, well, what exactly did you show me? I showed them everything. Way to go, chief. You know, I, you know that's what he's thinking. What are you doing? You don't even know these men. And I like the response. He said, there's nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. In other words, you just showed the fox the door to the hen house. You just opened the door of, and, and, and here, let's think about this a minute. You know, I believe in application for us. We do it almost daily. We show the devil our weakness. Where am I weak? And he exploits it. I don't know about you, but he works on me that way. He'll find a weakness and he will get in there and he will, he will just gouge away at that weakness until it becomes, it festers and it becomes sore and I start, I start making bad decisions or doing the wrong thing or, or thinking the wrong way because I've allowed him to build a foothold in my life. Now, how many of you have made this mistake in your life before? You have depended on something, someone else, some other substance to help you as opposed to God. Yes. It's, it's easy to do. We all fall prey to that. You know, I mean, let's think about it. When we get into financial trouble, we think we just have to have more. We just got to work harder. We just got to work more hours. We just got to make more money. At all costs. And sometimes that costs us our health. Sometimes that costs us uh, our time with God. Sometimes that costs us, uh, the cost outweighs the benefit. And sometimes God would just say, you know, maybe if you would wait upon me, I would show you a way that you need less so that you will have more with what you got. The fun thing about it is, and, and I don't preach about tithes, I don't, I don't beat that horse to death. I believe that that's, a, that's, a, that's something you work out between you and the Lord, and there's boxes back there, and that's where you do that. But, but let me explain something to you. God has a system of tithes, and I promise you it works. It does. I mean, it, it, I, I tithe with what I had in my wallet, so to speak, you know, a 10, a 5, a 20. That's the way I used to pay my tithes. You know, well, when the plate went by, put something, just put something in it. Just don't be sitting there like a lump on a log and don't put nothing in it because there's people watching. Anybody else ever had that problem in church? Yeah, yeah? okay, thank you. I was beginning to think I was the odd guy here. But, but that's the way I paid my tithes. I, I never read about the principle of tithing in the Bible. But it's there, I promise you. 
And, and, and my wife actually taught it to me when we first got married. I didn't agree with it, but she taught it to me. And after <clears throat> pulling teeth, she applied it. It worked. I seen it and went, hmm. Married a pretty smart girl. Let me tell you, when you apply what God teaches, it always works. Yeah. When you apply what God teaches, it always works. Yeah. Now, for just a minute, play along with me here. Do you remember in the, I don't remember which book it's in, but when he was dealing with the disciples, they had fished all night. And he went and got in their boat and told them to push out into the water. So they push out into the water. And he, and he preaches from the bow of their boat. And then afterwards he turns to them and says, hey, boys, if you'll let your nets down on the other side of the boat. Hey, 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 hey. Look, you were preaching. That's good. Let's go in. We'd like to go to bed. We've been up all night doing this. We've already finished. Nothing's biting. Let's just go to the house. Now, that's not exactly the way it's worded, but it did say that they did tell him they had toiled all night. We've already done this. And he says, but wait a minute. I said put your nets on the other side of the boat. And so they did. And they pulled in more than they could contain, so much so that they had to call another boat and the buddies over there to pull in the rest of them. So when you apply what God tells you to do, even when you're tired, even when you toil all night, even when you, you just don't think, oh, there's no way I can do this, when you do what God tells you to do, it always pays off. Yeah. I mean, just think about, I don't know, some of us would really have trouble if we were blind, somebody spitting in the mud and putting it on us like a mud pack. How's that going to fix me? I can't see it, then you want to stick mud in my eye. Now you think about it a minute. You would think like that. Well, no, I wouldn't. It's Jesus. But you've got to remember, they didn't know then if he was the Messiah or just another, just the son of a carpenter. They'd heard all kinds of things. They knew they had heard that he worked miracles. See, we just all assume that they've been, everybody followed him around the whole time and seen all his miracles. But they didn't. Right. They had heard news of travel. So imagine coming to him blind and hoping that he would restore your sight. And he goes, yeah. You're going, What is this? My brother could have done that. I mean, that's what you're thinking. There's no healing power for sure in this moment. No, there's not. There's no healing power in that oil down there, neither. There's none. Zero. You cook with it. It's olive oil. But if you don't believe me, when the Lord... When you obey the Lord in the application of the mud, the oil, or anything else that he tells you to do, there's healing virtue and power in the application of it. It's not my hands. Not your hands. But it's his power through the application of what he told you to do. And you say, what's that got to do with all this? Well, Hezekiah doesn't do anything God tells him to do, but every great once in a while when he's in the depths of trouble and he's got no way out but, but God. And he's no different than you and I. We're always looking for the next person that's going to align with us and help us get something accomplished or do something we want to do. And you and I both know that's not the way you do it. You get on your knees before the Lord. He aligns with you and you get something accomplished. But that's the way you do it. Anyway, he moves on from there and he asks me, he says, do you realize that everything you just showed them is going to go away? You've allowed them in, you showed them the keys, you showed them the safe, you showed them everything you got and it's going to go away. 
And then on top of that, your sons are going to go and they're going to become eunuchs in the, in the palace. I mean, you're, you're going to lose it all, dude. Because you're not depending on the one you're supposed to depend on, you're depending on someone else, and they're going to take your goods, and then they're going to leave you standing there. And let me tell you just how dumb Hezekiah is. Oh, goody, there will be peace all the rest of my days. So in other words, if I give everything away, and I'm of absolutely no threat to nobody, and they've got my goods, they've got my sons, they've got everything, I can live in peace. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's kind of like if they come and repro your automobile, they turn off all your utilities, you don't have a car, so you don't have to have insurance, so guess what? I can now live in peace. Yeah. I have nothing to pay for. I guess that's the way you look at that. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't see any logic in his thought patterns there. But obviously he did. And as he moved forward into 40, and this kind of sets up 40 uh, through 55, uh, 39 did. Actually 30, 37, 38, and 39 kind of sets up 40 through 55. And, and basically it says comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Comfort my people, speak kindly to my people. Not just the remnant, but all of them. Speak kindly to them. Speak comfort to them. Speak softly, speak tenderly. You can take that any way you want to. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The even ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Basically, he is talking about the track and travel of the Lord while he's on this earth. And he's saying, we're going to make it all level ground. And the voice who calls out from the wilderness, uh, you'll hear this a couple of different ways. First of all, they talk about just the voice calling out as one who is lost in the wilderness and looking around going, the wilderness is a mess and it needs to be cleaned up for the Lord to pass us through the wilderness. Then you hear it portrayed another way, that that is the voice of John the Baptist. A voice is crying out in the wilderness about preparing the way of the Lord. And so, me, I like to think of it that way. This is, this is prophecy of John the Baptist's time when he will be preparing the way for the Lord, when he will go before the Lord and prepare the way. And what he will do is he will, he will take people who believe and don't believe and he will start to prepare them so when they do see the Lord, they're prepared for what they see and what they receive and what they hear. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you think about this just a minute. I want you to just imagine with me for a minute, think about the topography of our church. You know that most of the people here and what they believe, backgrounds they come from, and, and the different, just their different thoughts and beliefs and and, and ways to pursue the Lord. Every one of us is a bit different in that. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Many of you have heard about healing ministers, faith ministers. They come to the church and they walk in and they share a message with you. Their message is going to be quite different than most things that you've heard. Because their message is going to be about the power of the Holy Spirit to heal. And, and, and how God has allowed them to be a conduit or a vessel for that spirit to move. And that they're going to be anointing with oil and they're going to be praying over people. And, and so that's no problem as long as they walk down through here and they pray and nothing happens. But if somebody gets up out of a wheelchair and starts walking, that's a problem. 
Not because they're not victorious, but because that scares the bejeebies out of us. Once we get over the initial, I wonder if they were really crippled to begin with. That's the first thing we do. Just now. I can see. I can. That flag's got red stripes and white stripes and, and a blue square and some white stars. And, and you're going, mm. I mean, anybody can take a stick and do this coming in. I mean, let's, let's think about this a minute. That's what people start to think until they see more and more and more. Why do you think the healings that took place were so miraculous? Either that or you see someone you know. Or you see someone you know. That can happen too. That's a, that's a good point, Greg. Someone that you know, someone that you brought. I want you to think about the friends who lowered their buddy through the roof. Now, that's some good friends right there. Hey, look, we can't get to this guy any other way. We're going to drop you right in front of him. Lay still. I want you to think about that a minute. They had to have faith in what they were doing. Are they going to climb up on that roof and lower him down? But it didn't come because they seen it once and went, all right. They had seen it, they had heard about it, they had witnessed it, and they go, hey, we're going to give it a whirl. What have we got to lose? See, that's the most unique thing about John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord. Those people couldn't have taken it had he not began to prepare their heart. Most of them didn't want to believe to begin with. And those miracles, I mean, think about it. the first time he cast a devil out of somebody. <laughs> that would have scared the bejeebies out of half of those folks. Had John the Baptist not prepared him for the Messiah. Then they began to think. Well, then what does the religious leaders do? Let's start questioning. Let's start trying him on the wall. And every time he would answer them. He wouldn't refute the law. He would lengthen the law. He would strengthen the law. And they were, because he was all in right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing how it always works. But he says, it's going to be when, when, the, when, when we prepare the way for the Lord, we begin to level the ground. We begin to take people who don't believe and people who do believe, and we begin to, just like the mountains and the valleys, we bring them to level. The bumps, the rough spots, we begin to smooth those out. And he's talking about back in the day, they didn't have super highways like we got today that are asphalt or concrete or, you know, whatever that are, you know, fairly level and not too many chug holes in them. But if you had a road that went by or a path that went by your place, your job was to keep that part of the path clear and unobstructed and as level as possible and clean and neat and everything else. And so let's straighten these paths. Let's clean these paths. Let's prepare them. Let's get them level. Let's prepare the way for the Lord. And that's talking about here in Hezekiah in, 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 in the time of Isaiah the prophet. Talks about it in five as we do that. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. Not a few. Not a remnant. But all flesh shall see the glory of the Lord. When we prepare the way, church, when we prepare the way, then we have an opportunity ourselves, as well as with others, to see the glory of the Lord revealed. See, that's the whole point of the church, is you bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We combine together, we begin to even out the road. We begin to make smooth the past. We begin to prepare the way. And eventually God will show his glory to all mankind. And that's what he's saying here. 
And I love it because it says all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of God stands forever. A voice says cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord, or the word of God will stand forever. Now I want you to think about that a minute. We are being compared. Humanity is being compared to the grass and to the flower of the field. And what does that mean? We bloom. We have a life span. And we die. And, and think about that just a minute. Think about your life as that of grass or that of a flower. And your life span. What? what I don't know about you, I prefer to be the flower. Because grass just gets trampled under people's feet. It can be beautiful. It can be luscious. You can take your shoes off and walk in it barefooted. It sure feels good. Flowers are pretty. They smell good unless you're allergic to them. So you have all this beauty. But it's only here for a short time. So what do you want from that? Well, what does flowers do? They serve a purpose. What do they serve? Pollination. 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 Absolutely. They provide pollination. They, they, they continue their circle of life just as the wind blows. It moves their seed. And they regenerate and they grow again. Grass. Your grass in the winter looks dead, doesn't it? And somewhere in the spring, it starts to come back to life, and it's green again, and it's pretty again. It repeats a circle of life through it. And you say, okay, what does all that have to do with this part of the Bible? The people had a circle of life going, and their circle of life was dependent on God, just as ours is. You know, you weren't born just by chance. There was a purpose for you in life. There will continue to be a purpose for you. And your job is to seek that purpose and fulfill it. But the word of God will stand forever. Everything will come and go. Everything shall pass from this life. You, I, the grass, the flowers, buildings will fall down. Every, everything will pass. But the word of the Lord stands forever. So what he spoke thousands of years ago into the heart of his prophets, into those men that, that he gave his word to to write in the Bible if you think about that that word is still good today what we're learning here today has I mean what we're learning here today has application then and now and if we wait another 2,000 years and somebody's still here reading that it'll have application then as well because the word of the Lord lives forever and it continues for me. And I know that that's one of the hardest things that most of us Christians really struggle with. Before we take off into nine, I'm going to stop because that's a really good breaking point. But I, what I want to do, well, the time, the time is going to end this up by the time we kind of finish talking about this. One of the things I really want to point out in all this is sometimes as Christians, it's very, very difficult for us to understand the will and desire of God. And we all say the same thing. Well, you know, I just don't hear from God. Well, you do hear from God. You just don't recognize what you hear. Everybody hears from God. They hear differently. Very seldom does anybody hear. Do what? Okay. You know, very seldom does someone roll over in their bed and see writing on the wall. I'm not going to tell you it's never happened. 
I'm just saying, you know, most people, that's not the way they're going to hear from the Lord. He's going to speak to their ears. It's a, a still, small voice, a very quiet voice that speaks to your spirit. It speaks to you in your heart. Sometimes it can speak through other people. They can bring you a prophetic message, just like the prophet Isaiah did to Hezekiah here. They can speak to you through the word of the Lord. You can, you can pray, God, I need a word from you today. I need you to speak into my heart today. I'm seeking you for answers. And I have literally said that same prayer right there, opened it up, and began reading it with it. <laughs> Look in there. There it is. Now, does it say, you know, like, well, let me just, Lord, I'm seeking you for some direction for whatever. And it doesn't say, Joe, go to the left and then back to the right and you will be fine. It doesn't do that. But I've certainly seen it where it says, if you seek ye the Lord, then you will surely not fall into folly. And then you go, all right, <laughs> wait upon the Lord. If I don't have peace in my spirit, then I'm still waiting on the Lord. Some of you go, well, peace in my spirit, yeah. When the Lord has spoken to you, you will overcome your fears, you will overcome your doubts, and you will be, I won't say fearless, but you will have overcome your fears. You will be at peace. You will be comfortable with where God is taking you, what you've been praying about, what you've been asking about. You will then be comfortable where God's taking you. And, and that's what I think some people really, really struggle with because they expect to hear a, a, the definitive answer that said, you know, if you're praying about whether or not to sit on the right side of the church or the left side of the church, you know, Lord, which, which one's best for me? You know, and, 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 and you're kind of hoping to come in the back door and the whole right side of the church be moved off. Well, now I've got my answer. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. But you might walk in and in your spirit go, you know, I need to sit on the right side. Then go sit on the right side. He spoke to your spirit. Go sit on the right side. Well, I don't know. That could just be me thinking. Yeah, it could be. But do you really spend your time thinking about that? I have to think about that a minute. We often give ourselves credit for, for the answers that only God, we've been seeking him for. Well, I could be thinking that. Well, you could be, but not likely. Right. Or you wouldn't have been asking him in the first place. Amen. And so we need to learn to hear the voice of the Lord through the Spirit in our soul so that we can accomplish the things, the walk of the Lord. I'm not talking about a calling or anything else. I'm talking about just accomplishing your walk with the Lord. Yeah. You know, some people go, well, you know, I, I got saved and, and now I just go out every day and do the best I can. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to tell you, the best you can could be even better if you would trust in the Lord to walk with you. Yeah. Well, now, now, you know, I believe I got to do some things on my own. Well, yeah, you do. Get up. And start walking. But be sure and take him with you. I mean, honestly. Let's just think about something for a moment. Now, I've never been there, so I don't know anything about it. Maybe some of you have and can enlighten me. But if you were going to walk through the worst neighborhood in any major city, uh, an area known for violence, known for its gang factions, and, and, they, and they've got their gang uh, uh, signs painted everywhere, and you know you're fixing to pass through there. You're not going to just walk through there fat, dumb, and happy with your earphones in and not pay any attention, are you? I mean, now, I've got to pass through here. So would it be best to arm myself? Would I be best to have something with me, a stick, a bat, or something? I mean, I know people who walk in my neighborhood when I'm going to work in the mornings about 5.30, and they got sticks. Yeah. 
And I'm sure they got more than sticks, but sticks is what you can see. Right. I'm thinking, this neighborhood ain't that bad. But I mean, I got grandmas that are walking, and they got sticks, and they wave them at me to let you know. <laughs> and I just wave back at them as I'm driving out of the neighborhood, but they let you know I'm, I'm good. There's an older gentleman. He carries a little bit bigger club with him. And he just totes it in the way he's going. And he does the same thing. And, and so, I mean, we would prepare ourselves to take a walk like that. So why would we not prepare ourselves when we get out of bed to walk through life? Yes, amen. Why would you not prepare yourself and take the Lord, the best weapon you got with you? Yes. Why would you not depend on him to walk with you? Not one of them people get up in the morning and go, I got this, I don't even need this thing. And there's a couple of them I probably wouldn't hang the wheel myself. Just, you're good, go ahead. But they still prepare themselves. Why wouldn't we? Christians, tell me, why wouldn't we? Why would we not want, why would we let somebody else take that walk without being prepared? Why is that? Why do you think the prophet Isaiah spent so much time in 39 trying to prepare King Hezekiah? Hey, what are you doing? My job is to protect you. My job is to, to, to deliver the word of the Lord to you. Are you some kind of, you're the king. What kind of, what kind of example are you setting? Here, now let's have some fun with this. You're the church. What kind of example are you setting? How many of you in here are parents? Yeah, what kind of example do you set? What kind of example have you set? Sometimes. Sometimes it's the wrong one. Sometimes it's a good one. Sometimes it's sometimes it's the it's the saying I hate the most. Do as I say, not as I do. I mean, I understand it. I do. But children will never do what they hear. They'll do what they see. That's what they will repeat. Now, that being said, and I close with this, don't discount anybody speaking wisdom to you. Because you never know where it's going to come from. You never know where it's going to come from. I got a tidbit of wisdom last Sunday. Wouldn't have expected it at all. Never have even thought about it. But I want you to follow me here for just a minute. Pastor Joe, you know how our church says Maxdale Cowboy Church? It should say Maxdale Cowboy and Cowgirl Church. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what do you say? I mean, I never thought about it. Right. I never thought about it. You probably hadn't either, but now you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I went, hmm. And the more I thought about it this week, the more it has just resonated in my spirit. It's like, wow. Because that little one actually thought about that. And it meant something to her. You know why? She wasn't included. Because she's not a cowboy. She's a cowgirl. Now, think about that a second. Sometimes wisdom comes to us from the smallest. I think sometimes that's why the Lord said, let the children come unto me. Because unless you can think like them, you'll never inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because they think and they react and they believe 
and their faith, their faith is deep. You don't believe me, ask a kid to pray for you. They don't, they don't have to spend all day getting in the presence of the Lord. They just walk up. Would you pray for me? My, my, my foot hurts. Heal Pastor Joe's foot. They're gone. Dear Lord, heal Pastor Joe's foot. Amen. They're gone. And then they expect your foot to be healed. Why are you limping? Let's go. We prayed for it. Let's move. Because that's their faith. Guess what? Never underestimate who can lead you in the faith, who can lead you in your walk, who can teach you about the Lord. Always be open. That's another downfall of the church. We're like this. It's all, it's all, and, and I, you heard it last Sunday about connecting. You can connect. Well, you know, I, Brother Joe, I, I can't really connect because I'm not a people person. <laughs> You're a people, ain't you? <laughs> You're a people person. Well, my personality, well, your personality stinks because that's what you've told yourself all your life. Listen to me now. Well, you know, I just don't do very good. It's because you don't try. See, I can refute everything you say because God didn't make you not to be a people person. He didn't make you not to love people. He didn't, no. You just become rooted and grounded in being a tell-in. Right. Bottom line. So if you want to connect, first thing you have to do is open these up. It can't be about you. It has to be about them. Because you've got to know what they want, what they need, what their desires are. You know what? Now I know what that little one's thoughts are. I know what her need is. Her need is for this to say cowboy and cowgirl church. Come on, pastor. Why are you thinking? You've got to know what their wants and needs are. Because then you can truly connect with people. And that's what's hard for all of us. Because we tend to be about us. The most important person is us. I mean, think about it. <coughs> what we need, what we want, what our desires are. Can we accomplish what we want? Will this fulfill what we need? People are messy. People are messy. Nah, they can be. I know they're highly dramatic. And some are, some are just good people. Just good old boys and girls. And some, the drama. But that's with every, that's with every, any group that you're a part of. I don't care if you're a part of a livestock group. Uh, you pick a group. Your family. Your family. Your family's the worst. Your family can be the worst. The best and the worst. You love them, but you love them to hate them. Don't know how many times some counseling's been brothers and sisters and family squabbles. Same thing in the church, family squabbles. But we should all be listening to the Lord and walking with Him. And He will guide us into all unity. He will guide us in all of his purpose. And it will be all about him. Yeah. All right, any questions on tonight's teaching? Yes, ma'am. So I have this thought in my head. I want to pass Jordan into the promised land. I don't want to just look at it. I don't want to hit the rock twice when I should have only hit it once. Okay. Okay. So talking about it kind of generally feeling it, but how do you know if you've done it done right? I, I guess that's why God made different miracles in different fashions. The blind, you gotta go down the water to wash your eyes. Mm -hmm. Here you gotta put the mud on your eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was kind of different. How do we know? 
Well, I, I can only speak for me. Okay, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can speak for me. When I know that, that I am in the Lord's will, when I know that I'm doing what he has called me to do, there is a peace that comes over me and a direction that immediately comes to me and it was almost hit the floor. <clears throat> but there was, there, there's an immediate direction. It's like, I'm at peace with my decision, now go do this. And I don't have to think about it anymore. It's not even a matter of, I know in my spirit and I can go, okay, this is what we're doing. Because now I know the Lord has spoke to me. I have direction and I know that this is the right path. Yes, ma'am. That's a very good point. And that's one of the biggest stoppers for most of us is fear. My, very honest. Myself, that's one of the greatest stoppers for me is fear. Fear for my, my, my family, for our finances, for anything. For our health, for that's my great fear. I come up against that all the time. What do I do? You know, and you're right. The Lord doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but we walk in it a lot. You know, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, when I say I get a, 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 a path, I'm not telling you that I don't have bumps in that road. There's bumps along the way. But I know to stay on that path because I've already been assured that's the path. Now stay on it. Now there's bumps all over the place. And you get knocked around a bunch. And, and you, as you experience with the barrel race this year, but you know that path and you stay on it. Now that doesn't mean it's going to go. <laughs> What is going on? And he goes, stay on the path. Okay. So, but yeah, and then fear kicks in. For me, fear kicks in. And yes, ma'am, go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. We went someplace completely different this year. And, and we've seen a whole different group of people to some degree. Right. You know, and, and so. It's amazing sometimes when you when you do follow through and push and press through uh, is the is the proper church term for it. When you press through and you get to the other side, you know, oftentimes you find yourself ministering to a whole different group in a whole different place in a whole different world, and that's where you were supposed to be all along. But you were you were thinking, I need to be here, and, and so yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I do, I, I agree that, that not everything is smooth, but you, you're set, your purpose, your heart is set because you know. And so you don't have to, you don't have to guess again. You don't have to go. I don't know, I, I, I've not found, not found myself second guessing once I know. I found myself going, okay, Lord, we're gonna have to clean this up because I'm not sure where we're headed now. You know, things are a mess, where are we headed? And he's like, hey, 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 stay the course. It's going to be fine. There's, hey, it's always dark. It's just before the dawn. You know, it's always cold. It's just before the dawn, too. So that's always when you suffer. So just hang on. The light comes, yes. Um, I think we've heard it, you and I have heard it in the past in church, as when God's about to do something, you know, whether it's a new ministry or new whatever it may be, um, there are obstacles. And, and sometimes you'll hear it referred to as um, birthing pains, right? It's like you're giving, you're giving birth to a new, um, a new age, a new ministry, a new whatever it may be. 
and through, I mean, for women, we know what it feels like to go through a birth if you, you know, born a child and, you know, um, had a child naturally, or, you know, even if you have a, you know, C-sections or whatever, but they're still birthing pains. Sure. And that is, um, that's not going to be easy. It is painful. Sometimes it hurts really bad to ever get to that point. But then on the, on the opposite side of it, there's such a blessing, right, that comes, which is a little similar to when we talk about crossing the Jordan River into your promise, right? It, it's a promise, right, that the Lord's given to you. And so that's just another way, you sure. know, I think we've heard it. We, we, get, we, we hear that a lot in the church that way, you know, about the ministry or, or you know, something that you're birthing in the church. Yes, sir. You know, one thing that, that, that I will say that ministers to my heart all the time is it seems like every time something's about to go forth in my life personally or in the ministry personally, I always have to fight the devil tooth and nail. I have to battle him like cry. It's, it's like a fist fight in the middle of the street with the devil to get to the other side because he turns it on top notch to stop it because he knows that if we get there, what can happen? And it's never, it's a devastating blow to him and his way of living, his way of, of, of tricking people into living. And if he can stop us before we get started, and so I've always found my greatest fight comes just before something great's about to happen. And usually, I'll be honest with you, it's a mess. I mean, it is literally a mess to where you're just like, you're ready to just whatever and walk off. I mean, you're literally ready to say, I've had it. I'm done. You figure it out. I, I've had all I can take. And about that point, the Lord says, Keep riding this pony to the other side. You're going to be fine. And when you get over there, he unfurls his blessings. And it's always a great thing. It's a great outpouring. It's a great spiritual move. And, and so I, I urge you, if you're fighting the devil right now, he's got great things in your life. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let anything stop you. Keep rolling. Because it's just his way of trying to put the brakes on you. Push through, come out the other side, and watch the blessings unfold. Anyone else? All right, church. Let's stand right. I will remind you, watch the website, watch the Facebook page, and watch the prayer request. Uh, if we're not going to have church on Sunday based on the weather, it's, it's supposed to get nasty. We'll see. Uh, I'll try my best to make a call by pretty early Sunday morning so that if we're not going, you'll know it early. And uh, or Saturday night, if it gets bad Saturday night, then right now they're saying it'll be Sunday morning early. So uh, we'll just take a look at it. I don't. It's not always about you getting here. Sometimes it's about you getting home. Right. And uh, I, I would prefer you not to have to do either one if if it's going to be a detriment to you. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Love you too. Love you. I love getting to be here with you and. And, and, and share God's word. I'm, let me just say this. I'm so thankful for everybody who takes their time to be here. I really, really am. And uh, appreciate you so, so much. Let us pray tonight. Father, I thank you. I thank you for each one that is here. And I pray your blessings upon them and upon their lives. I pray, Father, that you will guide and direct their paths. And I pray that you will lead them, Lord Jesus, in the paths that you have for them. Father, that your protection would rest upon them. 
And Lord, that you would prosper them in everything they put their hand to. Father, let your protection go with us now as we leave. Bring us back together so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And these things we humbly ask in Christ's name. And everybody says, Amen.